afternoon and welcome to the Sunset Safari. For those of you joining us for the first time, my name is Jamie. I have Brian on camera with me this afternoon. James will be out and about on Wendy with Jandre. And together we will be bringing you a safari live from the Great Plains of Africa. Slight exaggeration. Uh, the great bush felt of Africa. In this case, we come to you from Juma, Arethusa, and Cheetah Plains on the Saab, in the Sabi Sands, which falls into the Greater Kruger National Park area of South Africa. And not only are we coming to you live, but we are also interactive, which means that you can send through your questions and your comments on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv. Let us know where you're f watching from. We love to hear from all corners of the globe, where it seems as though our safari stretches across to reach. And on this warm autumn afternoon, I would guess at around 31, 32 degrees centigrade. So between 86 to about 90 Fahrenheit. I'm just throwing a temperature out there, judging on what it feels like. Definitely a complete contrast to our brisk, chilly morning. And this morning I spent most of my morning trying to track down and find some lions. In this case, it was the Inkahumas plus one Birmingham boy. My efforts were somewhat way waylaid by a rather upset elephant herd that found the lions before I did and didn't take too kindly to their presence and chased them away from where they were. However, we did manage to catch up with the Birmingham boy casting about for the female that he's obviously courting within the Unkahumas, and then the other four of them up near Sydney's dam. Now, for those of you who missed the sunrise safari, you may have heard about James locking me in the bathroom in order to race across to Cheetah Plains for the sunrise. I am on my way for the first time since we've started traversing Cheetah Plains to go and explore there, see if I can follow up on those two male cheetah with very full bellies that James had this morning. James may or may not be trying to escape from the bathroom this, this afternoon, which is why he may not be somewhat, maybe somewhat waylaid. I am, of course, entirely joking. James has not locked me in the bathroom and I have not locked him in the bathroom. And we are quite amicably amicably making our way, taking turns to go to Cheetah Plains. <laughs> uh, unlike Brent and James, I haven't managed to get my technology working, so I have an actual map. Uh, Aaron, who is watching in New Zealand on the subject of the Inkahuma pride, Aaron was wondering whether or not we were aware of the fact that Junior was on Elephant Plains. Aaron, that update only came through to me in the last hour or so. I had not been aware of that up until that point. We knew or we suspected that Junior, I think I mentioned that he might have been spotted on Buffel's Hook about 10 days ago, but it was never confirmed. And obviously the people that, that spotted him were not as familiar with him as, for example, certain of our viewers are. So Junior has done a big circuit through Kruger and come back to the center of his pride's territory. It could be very interesting. Through east and join us around Juma. That being said, I say hopefully, maybe hopefully not actually, it wouldn't be the best idea for him to return to what is essentially the heart of the Birmingham boy territory, especially not at the age he's at now. Now, for those of you who are new to our live safaris, perhaps have only been watching in the last few days, weeks, or months, Junior was a male of around three or so years old at the time of the Birmingham boy takeover of this area. Now, he was already at the age where he was starting to show interest in females coming into estrus, and that included, in his case, because he was isolated to his pride, that included interest in his mother and his aunt and his sisters. That was that time that all male lions go through in their lives where it is they are actually pushed away from their pride, and instinct tells them that it is time to leave their pride and to disperse and go off in search of territorial and mating opportunities. 
the one major disadvantage that Junior was put at was that he is just one male all on his own. And when you're heading out into the big, wide, scary lion world, being on your own certainly doesn't help matters. One of the reasons why the Birmingham boys were as successful as they have been at such a young age in terms of taking over this particular territory, they might not be the biggest lions in the Sabi Sands, but there's five of them, all in some way related to each other. And having five in your arsenal certainly does help matters. That being said, we cannot discount Junior as he could well hook up with another young male that is of a similar age, doesn't have to be related to him. We'll just have to watch and see how this scenario plays out. There's Impala dashing about. I'm going to make my way through to Cheetah Plains for the very first time. I'm very excited. While I do that, let's say hello to Mr. Hendry. Hello everybody, I'm in a slight panic. I want to show you something there on the road. Just the little bushel on the side of the road, Jandri. That's it there. Yay! It's a painted lady, everyone. Mm. Don't say anything, Jandre. Jandre is a doesn't like butterflies for some reason. He feels morally that we shouldn't be filming them from above. He's a very strange fellow. My name is James Hendry. Jean Dre, the strangeness hoppy, the foot, is on camera today. He stubbed his toe again today and it bled. <laughs> Let's look at the painted lady again. And uh, please do talk to us during the course of this live safari. As Jamie said to you, we are live from the northeast corner of magnificent South Africa, recently voted the most beautiful country in the world, largely by South Africans, but we all agree that we do live in the most beautiful place on earth, even if the politicians are born of a stupidity not seen since most granite stones were formed by volcanic activity millions of years ago. Never mind about that. Uh, so because we are live, it would be very good to talk to you. Hashtag Safari Live. Questions at wildearth.tv. Just put the camera on the butterfly. Questions at wildearth.tv. Or <laughs> you can also talk to us on YouTube. So that is the painted lady, everybody. Now, John, just keep filming the painted lady because the painted lady is a beautiful butterfly. And it's the first one I've seen after I saw it in the book yesterday and it reminded me of the gorgeous painted lady. And I will show you a picture of it just now. Jean Rose, stay there. It's beautiful colors. Right, here we go. Right, you may now come back to the side, Jean Rose. There we go, well done. There it is there, the painted lady. And I feel that that picture does not do it anything like the justice that it is due, for it is such a beautiful butterfly. Thank you. Well done, John Ray. That was our start. We will only be doing another 455 butterfly species this afternoon. Here we go. My plan this afternoon, everyone, is to go on to Arethusa for a little while. Apparently, three of the Birmingham males were found there, possibly the same three that were on Cheetah Plains yesterday morning. They will no doubt be fast asleep by this stage of the afternoon. But let's just go and have a quick look there see what they're doing and if they are asleep we might come back later otherwise we will go back towards the Ingahumas. and Snoop you're wondering about the injured lion and of course we think they that well we don't know for sure I'm not sure which of the Birmingham's was injured now remember there were five to start with one of them seems to have sloughed off somewhere else don't know where he is the older one I think has moved away but there are still four that are regularly seen and three of them are now on Knobthorn clearings at Arethusa. One of them you saw this morning with Jamie going north into Biffle's Hook, possibly as the consort of one of the Inkohuma lionesses. Now, I don't know which of those four was the injured one, or if he is indeed one of those injured ones. I'm assuming that he was. But from all accounts, all of those lions are in very good nick. They're all absolutely fine. So I'm assuming that he's probably had a good meal, got over himself, stopped complaining about life, and uh, he's basically doing okay. So Arethusa is off to the west of us. And just to, if you are a new viewer, the, num the number of property names and different names of places in this area can get extremely intimidating. 
So let's quickly go uh, from wide out into the area where we are now. We're going through the 3.5 million hectare, 8 million acre Greater Limpopo Transfrontier Park. Transfrontier Park means that it covers over national boundaries. It goes east into Mozambique and north into Zimbabwe. Part of that, or the largest proportion of the Greater Limpopo Transfrontier Park, is of course the iconic Kruger National Park. And we are part of the Greater Kruger National Park in that we're not in the national park itself. We're on a collection of private reserves on the western fringes of the park called the Sabi Sands. There are no fences between us and the Mozambique farm, eastern Mozambican border and the far northern Zimbabwe border. So animals come and go as they please. Then within that collection of private reserves called the Sabi Sands, we're on a little one on the western fringes called Juma. And to the east, west of us, we traverse an area called Arathusa, and to the east of us, we traverse an area called Cheetah Plains. Most of our area is this 1,200 hectares or 4,000 acres or so. No, it's not quite that. About 3,000 acres or so of Juma. That's, the, that's where we kind of centralize our operations. And then 550 off to the east on Cheetah Plains, 550 or 600 off to the west on Arathusa. So in total, about 5,000 acres. It's all very difficult doing the imperial calculations as I'm trying to drive the car, but I do my level best for those of you who still insist that the imperial system, uh, despite its incredibly flawed logic, uh, is still the way to go. I'm just looking for another butterfly for jean -Dre to fill. And I mean, he brought this upon himself, of course, because as we were leaving camp, two beautiful Nyala there were, he didn't see them. So I assumed that he just wanted to look at small things like butterflies. So that's what we'll do for them until we find those lions on Arethusa. And as we turn to the west now, Bear in mind that uh, uh, I wanted to show you something that is actually obscured by other trees. It's not important. We'll do it on the way back. So you can see the sun is quite bright. It is a balmy 29 degrees Celsius, apparently, which is about 84 degrees Fahrenheit, if I'm not mistaken. I'm a genius. I got that right. Kirsten says that that is correct. And that's pretty good. I mean, it's autumnal. I've no doubt it will cool down as we go towards the evening time. Jandre, there's the tracks from yesterday. And Jandre, of course, fancies himself as a tracker. Which is, uh, I mean, I'd love to cast dispersions on that. But he did actually find the lion tracks yesterday. And he then found the lions just after that. So um, I'll have to say that he's not quite. He's, um, well, he's, he's, he's pretty good. He's okay. Autumnal afternoon, perfect temperatures. If you are worried about temperature, if you don't like the cold too much and you don't like too much heat, this is the best time of the year to come, I think. For about two months now, we'll have very delightful, gentle temperatures. Many of you who've been watching for a long time have been concerned or have been interested in the life of Junior. Now, Junior, of course, is a now four-year-old, I think, four-year-old male lion who lived with the Nguhuma pride, was born into the Nguhuma pride of the Matimbas, sired by one of the Matimba males. And he was apparently sighted on Elephant Plains. Now, I'd be fascinated to know who identified him and how they know it's him, but it is entirely possible that that's where he is. It's quite a long way west of here. Um, Shell, you're in Detroit, and you want to know if it's possible for him to join the Birminghams. No, not at this stage. Oh, look, I say no, nothing's impossible. I say no, though, because the Birminghams have already taken over a territory. They are no longer in need of coalition mates. They don't need anyone to help them out. 
they have achieved what they set out to when they left the Birmingham farm in Timbavati uh, about probably a year and a half ago. They've taken a territory of their own. They have now sired two litters, two or three litters of cubs. They're in the process of doing the same again with our lions here, the Uruma pride. So the chances of them accepting a strange male unrelated to them into their coalition, I would say, are negligible to zero, I'm afraid. But what would be interesting, actually, I think, I don't think it's going to happen, is his father and uncle, who are now resident on a piece of Londolozi, roughly the same size as the room I live in, um, it would be interesting to know if he would join them because they would recognize him. And while they would throw him out of their own territory, they are seriously squeezed at the moment. They're being squeezed by the um, Jingalans to the west, the Birminghams to the east and north. There's a coalition, I think it's the Castleton males to the south of them, and they are being seriously squeezed. And I think it would be quite interesting. If, if he wanted to join up with other males, his uh, best bet would be to either join um, the, what are they called? The Shimungwe Pride males, the three young males there, or to join up with his father and uncle. That would be his best bet at this stage. It's always a fascinating thing because you read textbooks and they'll tell you that this doesn't happen and this does happen. And then, of course, the animals come out here and they confound all predictions. So I'm never, ever going to say again it's impossible for something to happen out here. So often we've ended up with egg on our faces because we've said, no, nah, that will never happen. And the next day, lo and behold, it happens. We shall turn in along Red Dam Road into Arathusa, and then we will head down towards Knobthorn Clearing, which is not far from the western, from their eastern boundary. There is a little steerbook running across the road. I don't know if you saw that. Antelope. You don't want to be the size of a steering book out here, I don't think. Don't you think it must be a terrifying existence, Rondra? I suppose you wouldn't know, of course, you're quite a large fellow. Me, I'm not a large fellow, so I've lived a life of terror, you know. Large, predatory people like you uh, threatened me all my life. So you bully us. So I bully you now because you can't say anything while you're on camera. subject of Jean-Dre's favorite organism, that being the butterfly, uh, Bethany, you want to know if we get swallow-tailed butterflies here? Yes, we do. We get two or three very beautiful species of butterfly. The most common is the citrus swallowtail, and I will show you a picture of him, Bethany, only because you asked me. Um, there they are. There are the swallowtails that we get here. Are you showing us a butterfly? Yes. Well done. There's the, that's the citrus swallowtail. It's the most common one on the top. I have seen the green-banded swallowtail, but not very often. Then the emperor swallowtail, I think, actually may be almost as common as the citrus swallowtail, but it's just the only difference is that kind of uh, little sticky arty bit on the hind wing. I'm sure it has a proper term, but the sticky arty bit will have to suffice for now and one more over there that I've seen. The rest are around here. So, yes, Swallowtails, thank you for that, Bethany. Leave it, John, well done. You selflessly got over yourself and filmed a butterfly of your own form. Again, if you lose hearing of me this afternoon, please feel free to send me a virtual clip over the back of the head because I don't have the lapel mic on now, which means I need to be either talking into this one, tap tap, or this one in the front. So if I start mumbling incoherently, feel free to send me a virtual slap on the head via Kirsten McClellan-Smith, who will be only too happy to deliver it. Right, Jamie's got some signals. She's on her way to Cheetah Plains for her first exploration, which I think will be very exciting. Let's go and see how she's doing. So 
exciting for me. There's nothing better than sort of half, not being lost, just not knowing exactly 100% where you are. I do actually vaguely know my way around the main roads of Cheetah Plains. I know this road relatively well, I think, just from a journey or two to the repeater site. I should be able to find my way with relative ease and with Ryan's great help and guidance to where those cheetah were left this morning with James. And isn't it amazing how Cheetah Plains has really lived up to its name over the last two days with two separate, hopefully three separate cheetah sightings since we first started traversing just three days ago. Something exciting for us to look forward to. And of course, the prospect of a whole new, well not, not in every case, but the prospect of a new cast of characters, nevertheless. Right, so this is the boundary road. This, this is central. And the roads have also been beautifully dragged. Here we go, that's our bath in Koro. Yes, in Koro. You can actually see what I mean when I say that the roads have been dragged. You can see that big mound of dirt in the middle. There you go, you can see where the tractor has been traveling along down the road and dragging the wheels of or dragging big tires behind it is just a way of smoothing out the bumps and the corrugations that develop over time. Uh, the one thing that Cheetah Plains, of course, is for us one of the most exciting things about Cheetah Plains has been the prospect of these long or big stretches, vast stretches of open plains. But Ravi, you were wondering what apart from the open clearings sets Cheetah Plains apart from the rest or from where we've been traversing in the past? One of the answers is that they've actually had less rain. So there, we're going to see the impact of the drought in a slightly different manner around Cheetah Plains. It took them, they did have a little bit of rain when we did, which is why it is still a little bit greener than it was when I first came and visited Cheetah Plains when we were still discussing the possibility of traverse. Sorry, I have to learn as I go along. Okay, noted. I know which junction that is now. Just double checking. The best way to learn rows is to drive them. So Ravi, that's gonna be one of the things that we will see the impact of. The other is we're going to start, because of its proximity to Kruger, and in fact its boundary falls in places directly across from Kruger, it's going to be interesting encountering different animals that aren't necessarily relaxed to the same degree that the Sabi Sands animals tend to be. So for example, the leopards and, and the elephants especially that come through here. This is a peculiar junction. Okay, whoops. That's not where the road is. Here we go. That will mean encountering animals and the, the prospect of encountering, and of course this applies to Juma and Arethusa as well, since it is open completely to the Kruger National Park. There are no fences around it. But just the prospect of maybe encountering a lion pride that we do not know or that we've never seen before or leopards that have moved in from the Kruger National Park, just like we've had that scenario with Gijima, the phantom leopard of Buffelshook Dam. These are all exciting prospects for us as we travel along. I must say in places, apart from the wide, vast clearings of the eastern side of Cheetah Plains, from what I'm seeing now and from what I have seen, it's actually in places denser and thicker than Juma and Arethusa, so it's going to be different there. And then, of course, the prospect of following up on stories of leopards that have been seen in the past, such as quarantine, Kunuma turn, but seeing quarantine more frequently. Quarantine was Karula's son, or one of her sons, prior to her current litter of cubs. 
Okay, so I want a bit of lift here. Here we go, okay. I got it, I got it. I understand now. This is just a good way to learn. And as we make our way across to our cheetah sighting and keep our fingers crossed that they are still hiding out in the shade somewhere, Simon was wondering about a genetic abnormality that occurs within the cheetah population and was wondering if there are any king cheetah within the wild earth traverse area. And the answer is no, not that we know of. But that's sort of the wonderful thing about the vast open expanse towards Kruger and in fact the wonderful thing about cheetah is that there could be. We could come round to the corner one day, look and the king cheetah genetics, it's, it's almost like a, a type of melanism, it's a, it's a bolder, blacker coloration that king cheetahs have. Ah, and we come now to three in a row pan. No? Am I wrong? This isn't three in a row pan. Yes, it is. This is where three in a row pan is. See, I'm learning already. Sorry, Simon, I'll get back to your question in a moment. Let's just check one of the pans quickly, see if they haven't decided to move up here. The one thing about the roads having been dragged is that the tracks will have been obliterated from this morning. So they might have moved away slightly from where they were before. So I'm just going to do a quick circuit of the life around the pans. So Simon, genetically the, the type or the king cheetah is relatively rare. But cheetah themselves as an animal are impossible to fence. There are naturally occurring nomadic cheetah that wander throughout the farmland areas, proper wild cheetah that can move between farms onto, into Kruger and anywhere around there. Three in the row pan, of course, is where I'm sure that James and Brent have both stopped here. The three in the row pan during the time before the rain. This was where buffalo came to get eaten by the Birmingham boys. I think they, for the past three weeks at the beginning of the year, they were just lying up here, basically waiting for the buffalo that had to come to drink at three in the row pan, including this female. You can tell that it's a female just by the size of the horns. Might have been a sub-adult male, but they don't cover all the way, you can see how that boss, so the base of the horns is not very developed in the same way it is of a male buffalo skull. Don't see any cheetah hanging out here. I can hear a red crested cohorn whistling in the distance. So Simon, there are no king cheetah that we know of. That doesn't preclude the option that gene for the king cheetah, whilst it is recessive, in other words, you need two individual carriers, and even then, you've only got about a 25% chance that one of the cubs will be born with that king cheetah coloration. All of that aside, that gene does naturally occur out here, and it could happen, just in the same way that all of a sudden around Singita Labombo, there's a legovan poking its head up, just there by that termite mound. Do you see him, Brian, between those two mounds on the edge there? Just see his little head poking up. Looks at first glance like a water monitor, but I can't fully see the coloration. Rock monitor lizards tend to be slightly more striking in terms of the brightness of their colors. And I'm giving him a little bit of distance just to give him a chance to get used to us and also for us to have a chance to see him clearly. Let's see if he doesn't decide to come for a swim in this pan. I think he's quite content to hide there. He's a large leg of one. Let's go a little bit closer. He might duck into the termite mound itself. What's he going to do? 
he is going to disappear. There he goes into the termite mound seeking refuge from us and from the hot midday or the mid-afternoon sun. Now there are other animals out on in the Sabi sands that are seeking refuge from the hot sun. Let's head across to James and some lions while we make our way towards those cheetah. Now, what do you see over there, everybody? Lying in the shade of that knobthorn tree there, you will see the silhouetted head of the supposed king of the beasts. And he's looking at you. Let's go and have a slightly closer look. It be a little while to spot them. And eventually we pick them up, lying under that tree in the shade, as Jamie says, sheltering from the sun. It's not a very hot sun, it's a very pleasant sun, actually. Just listening to the game drive radio. where they have made a track already. I don't we can avoid it. Oh, look. There's a nest here. It's still here. The nest birds, I'm sure it is because they're very cock. There it is. Can you see it, remember? It's right here. There we go. It's a little nest with a crown black wing. They're all very cross in case. We should drive over their nest. They have, of course, put it in a very stupid place. But they are warning us, I suppose. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Yeah, let's leave them. They make very good stress. And there are the lions. Surgeons, I have relocated at the southern end of the problem. Clearance animal static. Is that what? Okay you? you happy there? Okay, good. Um, Andrew, you have got hold of us all the way from the Ukraine. Now, that is very exciting. I'm not sure that we've spoken to you before. Or I'm not sure that I have. And you want to know why it's called a coalition, a group of male lions, as opposed to a brotherhood. I um, don't think there's any real reason, Andrew. Sometimes I've heard them called brotherhoods before. So I suppose you could call a coalition of male lions a brotherhood. They are normally brothers, or if they're not brothers, they're certainly cousins most of the time. So I guess you could call them a brotherhood. I think it's just a sort of uh, more biological term that they use the term coalition. Quite an interesting question. They are a brotherhood, though, Andrew. I mean, that's exactly what they are. And we're not going to spend too long here, everybody. I know that there are going to be people trying to get into the sighting. And, of course, these lions are doing not a great deal. And again, the Birmingham boys, to me, although we don't see them very often, they are not the largest male lions I've ever seen in my life by any stretch. They are still growing. They're only probably mm, four and a half years old, I think. Maybe a bit older. Maybe they're five by now. They're probably five. And they will get bigger. Their manes will get fuller. And they will... In fact, yeah, I mean, if you look at their noses, Rhonda, if you can get in close on him, that's it. His nose is hardly any, it's hardly black at all. Now, it will be completely black by the time he's six years old. And the fact that his nose is almost entirely pink still tells me that he's probably not quite five yet. And so they will get bigger. But for what they make up or what they lack in obvious bulk, like the Matimbas had, they make up for in a complete seeming fearlessness. And they managed to chase those Matimba male lions off without so much as a physical confrontation, despite the fact that the Matimbas are a lot bigger than these chaps. 
There are five of them, or there certainly were five of them, and I don't know if anybody's heard, perhaps, where the last one has gone. <laughs> I love this question. Miss um, Lynn, you're in North Carolina, and <laughs> you want to know if the presenters have got better eyes than the average person. Uh, Miss Lynn, no. The actual answer is no. We don't have better eyes than anyone else. Certainly, I don't have better eyes than anyone else. I have what's known as uh, monocular vision, which means I only see with one eye at a time. My ability to see... Um, 3D or uh, depth of field like yours, like you can, is quite severely hampered. It doesn't affect my life at all. I just can't be a jet pilot, which is a relief to everybody in the world. Uh, so I don't have very good eyes at all. Um, but what you get used to, Miss Lynn, is a shape. You get used to looking for certain things. So I spotted him moving from quite a long way back there, from where basically where we started off the sighting, about, what's that, John, about 200 meters? Maybe 150 meters or so. 149. 149 meters. Is that what the focus is? 149 meters. Thank you very much for that. That's about 450 feet. So I spotted them because they were moving. So that's always something that you look out for, unusual movement. But basically, Miss Lynn, it's getting used to looking for shapes that you start to recognize as the animals you want to see. Um, certainly with some of the trackers, like we had that experience with Renius and Flongo the other day, one of the great master trackers of South Africa, his eyes are unquestionably better than mine. They're unquestionably be better than most people's eyes. Again, because he is so used to it. He's so used to looking at things. He's so used to this environment where he spends, he's has spent his life looking at tracks, looking for things that he might be able to eat when he was a child looking for animals and different things that his guests, when he was working as a guest tracker, uh, might be interested in seeing. And now latterly, of course, every scuff mark and every little piece that might indicate where an animal that he's looking for has gone, then he... Sorry about that. My audio is a little bit bad. Um, he will then... Uh, you know, he can just see things that you and I are unable to see. I don't know that that necessarily means that his eyes are better or whether it is just simply the fact that he is used to what he's seeing. And I think it's most likely the latter. Certainly, I've got to tell you, though, I mean, amongst the local people out here... Uh, sorry, just fiddling the game channel. Amongst the local people here, you very seldom see people who wear glasses or spectacles for short sight. And, I mean, amongst my family, Everybody except me wears spectacles for short sight. Uh, I, at school, uh, many, many people did, and lots of sort of Europeans, I guess, as they, guess, as they get older, succumb to some form of short-sightedness. Whereas out here, I have to say that I think very few of the locals are short-sighted. And yes, there is a, a lack of access to sort of uh, op optometrists and people who can check your eyes out, but still, I think people here generally have got a better state of eyes than the average sort of European South African, which I think is quite interesting. But no, Miss Lynn, in a very long roundabout way, my eyes are absolutely no better than anyone else's. In fact, they're probably a bit worse. Uh, Scott was very good at spotting small things. Brent is pretty good at that. And uh, I think Jamie's also excellent. Not sure about Sam at this stage. Now, these lions, I think, ate something yesterday. The uh, one in the middle certainly has got a very fat belly, and so does the one on the left, actually. But they're doing what lions do best, of course, which is, jean -Dre? Nothing. Correct. Absolutely nothing. But luckily, jean -Dre, all around this clearing, there are butterflies in a huge abundance. We've got African migrants, the little green minty ones. We've got sulfur orange tips. We've got monarchs. We've got painted ladies. We've got 
broad bordered grass whites. Well done, Jean Dre. Brilliant spot. There's the salt. No, that's the minty one. That's the African migrant. Two of them in one shot. Can you believe your luck? Hey? One of those is actually a, a sulfur orange tip. I tell you, the profusion of butterflies and insects over the last few days as these flowers have come up has just been amazing. You can just maybe feel the peace of the afternoon, which will change as we go towards night. So the kind of tension of the wilderness will build up as the lions get moving and we know the hyenas and leopards get moving as well as the sun goes down. At the moment, the bush is still very much lulled into a sense of peace by the hottish sun. Lovely, subtle call of the doves in the background. Very peaceful, isn't it, John Dre? Mm. Oh, high action at the lions. Hello, Ravi. Uh, good afternoon to you. Interesting question from you that I'm not sure I understand the basis of. You want to know, you say, given that predator numbers have unquestionably declined in the last 20 years, have prey numbers done exactly the same thing? Um, Ravi, prey, predator numbers in the Kruger Park have not declined in the last 20 years. I would say that they've stayed probably relatively the same. Um, predator, you know, within, I mean, obviously there's a dynamic equilibrium where they go up and down. And prey numbers, I'd say, are probably about the same. I think populations in the Kruger National Park and surrounds have remained roughly the same over the last 20 years or so. Yes, give or take a couple hundred or a thousand in the case of buffalo here and there. But, yes, certainly outside... Ooh, I'm going to continue this just now, Ravi, because Jamie has got something really special to show you. Look how exciting this is. The first ostriches I have seen since I started working at the Sabi, or on the Sabi Sands. Hi guys. And this is one of the other attractions of these large open spaces of cheetah plains. They're across our boundary on Mala Mala, but nevertheless, we've got an awesome view. <clears throat> of one of the most peculiar creatures that the African bush can provide. Look at them all with those long, long legs. Feels like forever that I've seen the ostriches. I don't even know what the collective noun is for a group of ostrich. Look at them running. And of course, they're capable of covering tremendous distances. the females and the youngsters in the drab brown plumage whilst the male with his leading the group with his black striking black and white colors does anybody out there know what the collective term for a group of ostriches is i'm not entirely sure now an ostrich is an animal that i have to confess i have been quite scared of in my life especially as a child they are very, very big, obviously. I mean, they are the largest flight, the largest bird, and also flightless in the world. And they also have capable of kicking with tremendous strength. We've come across to where the cheetah were last seen, and ostriches are most definitely on the menu of a cheetah out here. It's actually one of their favorite food. And I've been fortunate enough in my time to actually see a cheetah chase down and catch an ostrich. It was unbelievable to watch. And the power that the ostrich shows when it sprints like that, its speed is almost as great as that of the cheetah, can almost run as fast, but then at the same time, 
it can also sustain its speed for much, much longer than a cheetah actually can. Fascinating creatures. They are disappearing off into the distance. I wouldn't be surprised if those ostriches would prove to be a temptation for our male cheetah. They might have decided to follow them across. Oh, there goes a warthog dashing away. There goes another warthog dashing away. What are you running from? He <laughs> like goes sprinting across the plains. Hmm. Surely not cheetah around there. The cheetah were very, very full-bellied from the screenshots that I saw. I'm just taking this opportunity to really properly scan this open area, just in case they have moved across. As our warthog continue their mad dash across the clearing, Wendy says a wobble or pride or flock of ostriches would be the correct collective noun. And this is something we can anticipate more and more of in terms of sightings. We will get regular ostrich sightings in these big open clearings. It's one of the animals, Ravi, that I forgot to mention. And in fact, I think we all, or I certainly have forgotten about in terms of a prospect of something to see. He's got a whole harem of females there with him. It's so interesting. And Laura is absolutely right. A male ostrich is called a cock and the female are called hens, just like with chickens. Well, they're youngsters. The eggs, first of all, are the most fascinating thing. 24, easily 24 times the size of a usual, of a, the average chicken egg, containing the contents of about 24 chicken eggs. And their little ones are the most amazing cryptic color. Very, very different to the adults as a way of hiding out. And very frequently the parents will actually shade them with their wings on these really hot days. We might even get to see their tracks at some point. We can stop and have a look. They leave, they've got two toes, one with a very, very sharp claw on the edge of it, the other a little bit smaller, and that's their main source of defense in terms of fighting off any kind of attack. That combined with their tremendous speed and the amount of ground that they can cover. Should we go see if we can find those cheetah now that we've seen the ostriches dashing across the clearing? I'm just checking very carefully. Let's just wait a second, see if they don't come out into the open. I don't think that they're going to, however. I think they're more comfortable where they are. But Brian, watching in, oh, there we go, Philadelphia as the male moves more clearly into view. You were wondering if ostriches live together in family units or if that male has collected a harem. And Brian, it sort of depends on the area that they are in. Males do collect harems and in this case I suspect that this might be his. But you also get groups living together with a couple of males and a couple of females. And in certain areas, they mate exclusively, one male, one female, and move about the area in pairs. In this case, I can only see one male. It could also be a male and a female with a couple of almost fully grown offspring. It would be the right time of year for baby ostriches to be almost fully grown. Is that two males on the left there? It does look like it's two males on the left much dark colouring with a, quite a stark contrast between the black and the white. I think that that is... fascinating to watch them plucking up seeds and grains and other vegetable matter that they manage to find. 
Now, like all birds, ostriches will assist or make up for the lack of their teeth by a mechanical process whereby they follow, swallow stones and store them in the very, very powerful stomachs. And they use those along with the crushing muscles that surround the stomach, far stronger than the, our muscles, to essentially masticate and grind up the food that they swallow and that they crush. And it's, been, it's a fascinating experience, that cheetah, or that cheetah sighting that I spoke of where the cheetah hunted the ostrich. I went back afterwards and I examined what was left of the carcass and had a look at the stomach contents. And I mean, they've got huge stones that they have swallowed. I'm talking almost the size, in, in places, almost the size of a large marble that sit within their stomachs, all crushing and helping to break down their food. Andrine, cheetah, as I said, are specialized ostrich hunters. They really, really enjoy chasing them down and catching them and are one of the few of the predators that are capable of matching the speed that an ostrich is capable of running at. That being said, it's not unheard of for leopards to take down ostrich or in fact wild dogs. It's generally not necessarily on their favored play, prey list. In the Kruger National Park, about 80% of a wild dog's diet is actually made up of impala. So there's very few cases where wild dogs will take down ostriches. Leopards and cheetah would be the main predators. If you're hearing the noise of a helicopter heading out around, flying past, it's one of the official helicopters of the Kruger National Park doing a, some kind of boundary patrol or something similar, helping to keep this whole area safe. Wow, it's been a long, long time since I've seen ostriches. And apparently you have seen, or the regular viewers have seen ostriches in the past, but I think this must be one of the first sightings in many, many years. Brian, have you ever filmed ostriches here? Uh, not on cheetah plains. Not on cheetah plains? Sandy patch, yes. I have photos of ostrich from December 28, 2014. Wow, awesome, okay, so that was what, that was two years ago, yeah. a year and a half ago, that Brian last photographed an ostrich on, or ostriches on Sandy Patch Road. It's always a possibility, these are definitely the first ones that I've seen. I haven't even seen tracks on Juma since I started working there last year, July. It's fascinating to watch them all go about their daily business. One of two flightless birds that are indigenous to South Africa or found in South Africa. I wonder if you can guess perhaps what the other flightless bird is that you might find whilst paying a visit to this lovely and diverse country. Let's see if you can, should be a relatively easy one. It is actually, however, one, a question that really embarrassingly caught me out on an exam once, back when I was still training to become a guide. So what is the other flightless bird that you can find in South Africa? You can send that through to hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv. And I find myself very sadly caught out because my box full of books is sitting on Wendy. Wendy sitting very sadly in the workshop where she waits, awaits the spare clutch pipe. You can really, you can, even at this distance, you can actually really see the color difference between the drab females and the sub-adults and the males. The male ostriches, as I said, can actually be truly terrifying. Being charged by an ostrich is probably one of the scariest, scariest charges I have ever experienced. And I'll never forget one family holiday I went on a hike early in one morning up into a mountain and I was looking down at where my family were staying and I saw an ostrich going around one corner obviously I was viewing all of this from above and I could see my little brother walking around the other corner and the two of them destined to collide and there was absolutely nothing I could do 
from where I was standing and then I just watched my watch these tiny little dots approach each other and then my little brother go dashing off in the opposite direction. He later told me that he had lost his piece of bread that he was eating. But they can peck and they can kick. They are not to be trifled with. And they have been known to cause serious injuries. And yes, Sarah, they are indigenous to South Africa. We not endemic, so in other words, they occur, they occur all the way throughout southern Africa and up further north. But they are indigenous to South Africa. They are naturally occurring here. A bird that is very, very well adapted to dealing with arid or dry conditions. They waste very little water and actually require very little water in order to survive. They don't need to have regular drinks, which is why you will find them throughout areas of Botswana and Namibia, where they are capable of, and again, of course, capable of covering enormous distances with those long, long legs. Well done to Gilly and Catherine and Wicked Anne and many more. But the other flightless bird was in fact the penguin. It used to be known as the jackass penguin. It's now known as the southern African penguin. That was the answer to the other flightless bird in South Africa. They occur around Cape Town, Boulders Beach area, famous for them. Very, very entertaining little creatures. Their calls are incredible and definitely something if any of you are planning a visit to South Africa and find yourself in the Cape area, they are definitely worth paying a visit to. I just heard wildebeest calling, but I don't think it was an alarm call. I think it was just a territorial call of a male as they start to reach their rutting season. I just keep watching the shadows and the grass cover really carefully, just in case those cheetah come sprinting out and after those ostriches. Although I think with those full bellies, they might be a little bit done for the day. Well, already not more than an hour in, we've had our first unusual sighting of cheetah planes. I'm going to carry on now for my search for these cheetah. Meantime, let's head back across to James and find out what he's up to. Now, while not quite as awesome as the yellow pansy that Jandre is reluctantly filming for you there, um, the ostrich, what a treat. That is magnificent. I've only seen one ostrich in the Sabi Sands before. With the lions. And that is a blue pansy. Look at them together there. Yellow pansy and a blue pansy doing a pas de deux in the air. And the lion sneezing consumptively off to one side. There are the lions. Now we've been looking at the butterflies, of course, and yes, they are quite late in the season for all these butterflies because of the late rain we've had and therefore the late flush of flowers. And Elaine, you make a very good... <laughs> Sorry, I'm kind of ignoring the slightly obscene things going on with the lions there anyway uh, elaine you want to know about the butterflies and will they have enough time to complete their life cycle given how late in the season they've kind of bloomed well i would say yes elaine i don't know for sure but given the fact that they uh, came out late you know they seem to have no problem coming out late when the late rains came late so i'm i've got no doubt that their eggs can stay dormant if they have to stay dormant i'm pretty sure all of these adults will be laying eggs as we speak we've seen them mating so yeah i think they will have time elaine to complete their life cycles very nice question thank you for that and just a quick one so the middle line there He's actually not in a great way. He did turn over, and then just before you came back again, he turned back over. He's got mange, definitely. He's got some kind of skin infection, so he's very easy to identify. And he's got a skin infection that is really, I mean, it, it's, I don't know if you've watched that show, The Game of Thrones, or read the books, and they talk about gray scale. 
and the kind of uh, elephantine skin that it creates. But that's exactly what's going on on that lion's belly. He looks dreadful when he turns over. He's certainly very fat. He hasn't lost any condition. But I'm sure it can't be particularly pleasant for him to have. Anyway, I don't think we're going to stay here for much longer, everybody. I know I've said that before, but uh, we, did, we did sit here for a while just to give you kind of one more view. Let's go and see what the Nkuhuma pride are doing. They are on uh, Juma, as we know, or well, they were this morning. So we'll go and see if the four of them are still around. Otherwise, we'll potter about there and see what else there is to see. I think it's been a good time with these lions. What I'm going to do is just drive around quickly so that you can see what I mean by the belly of this lion. I was answering a question for you about predators and prey, and let me just get into position here, and I will then complete answering it. Right, so there we go. There you can see the belly that is covered in that kind of pinkish, scaly flesh. So while the more veterinar veterinarily minded of you have a look at that and decide what it is, Ravi, what I was saying is, so Kruger Park, I don't think predator-prey dynamics have necessarily changed in the last 20 years or so, but throughout Africa, obviously, there is an enormous amount of pressure on the habitats that these animals have. And remember that for a long period, or for lengthy periods, even of last century, much of Africa's wildlife existed outside of national park areas. Now, as the human population went over a billion in Africa last, I think it was two years ago, so the pressure on the animals, especially outside of national parks, has increased. And yes, predators have gone down, but that hasn't affected their prey numbers. <laughs> Far more, the absence of prey numbers has affected the predators. So as human populations have encroached on areas where wildebeest and buffalo and impala and all those wild antelope and herbivores exist, so their prey numbers will have been pressurized more and more. And I think that's where you'll find the decline. Now, although I say Africa has got a billion people in it, remember that it's actually, compared with the rest of the world, fairly sparsely populated. India, a country on its own, nothing like the size of Africa, has got over a billion people in it. We know China, I think, is sitting on about 1.3 or 4 billion people. The continental United States has got about 350 million people, I think, and that is nowhere near the size of Africa. So it's not like we're massively overpopulated, but absolutely over the last 100 years or so, uh, natural areas and areas that aren't under official protection have become that much smaller. Okay, Jamie, as I knew she would, has managed to relocate those two magnificent male cheetah. Let's go across to her. I'm going to press on from the sighting and see what else we can see. Enjoy. So far, cheetah planes definitely spoiling us. Two very, very round-bellied male cheetahs. The same one that James found this morning just a little bit further south and almost on Mala Mala, which is why we are sitting at the distance we are sitting from them. And how special is this? I think since I've arrived here, I've seen cheetah maybe three or four times. And now we've been spoiled with a cheetah two days in a row, three drives in a row, or almost in a row. He is flicking tails going against in irritation due to the flies that have flocked around them. I would love to know what it was that they made a meal of. Whatever it was, it has certainly left them feeling very full and very warm. And as those tails flick about, you can actually really clearly see how different they are to leopard tails. They've just got a sort of a, a stiffer look to them. 
You know, leopard tails do the same thing, they flick about and in fact serve almost the same function in terms of counterbalancing the animal. But in cheetah those tails are so vitally important. When you're traveling at speeds of up to 60 miles per hour, which is close to just over 100 kilometers per hour, and then need to do a very sharp, very fast turn because the antelope that you're chasing is jinking and diving. Having a stiff tail to counterbalance and their tails. I've, I've actually spent a lot of time working with cheetah prior to, my, prior to my time spent in the UK doing my degree. I spent a considerable time with vets helping out with cheetah in the Kalahari, observing cheetah behavior in the Kalahari. And I've been fortunate enough to touch an anaesthetized cheetah and feel the weight of that tail. They are so heavy. And this particular cheetah had been rescued from a neighboring farm. The reserve that I was working at had a deal with neighboring farmers that they would come and remove an animal for free and take it through onto the reserve on the basis or provided that the farmer didn't try to injure or kill it in any way. And it's just one of the, the ways in which this particular reserve or the management of this particular reserve were aiming to reduce the conflict between wild animals and in particular livestock farmers. Because of course cheetah can be, in very limited circumstances, they can be a threat to farmers' livestock. And in this case it was a male cheetah that we had gone through and removed and put into a boma, which is a fenced off area. And he had to be in a boma on, for about three months out of concern that as soon as he was released onto the reserve, he his homing instinct would kick in and he would go straight back to where he had come from. And so I spent a considerable period of time going through feeding this particular cheetah and learning a lot about his behavior. And the one day when he was anesthetized for a thorough checkup and to address a minor injury, I was busy feeling the muscles around him, around sort of the back and the shoulder areas. And you think when you look at a cheetah, when you imagine a cheetah, you imagine it like an athlete with these hard as iron muscles built up and well developed through exercise. And they've actually got a completely different muscle structure to the way that we do. His muscles were actually soft and floppy. And it is one of the ways that they, it's a, it's a muscle structure that is capable of being highly energized, far faster than our muscles are capable of kicking into action. It's the reason that they are capable of such bursts of speed. So I was worried and one of the things that I asked the vet was whether or not, because he'd been confined, for three months at a time, whether he would lose physical condition, maybe lose fitness, and not be able to keep up with the rigorous demands of hunting in the wild. And the vet said that in all of his years of experience, he has never ever had a cheetah that's lost any kind of fitness. They'd not built or structured in the same way that we are. He used to come to the fence and chirp, chirp for food. He was incredible. Uh, James is on a roll as well. He's found another Birmingham boy to show you. Let's go and have a look. Uh, I think we're going to stay here instead. Um, I'm not sure whether James has lost any signal. But yes, spending a bit of time with cheetah, they are a completely different kettle of fish. Unlike the leopards and the lions, they fall into a completely separate branch of the Felidae family, the Aesiopteryx. I think I've got that wrong. That sounds like a dinosaur. That definitely sounds like a dinosaur. That's not what I meant at all. What I meant to say was they're not part of the Panthera family. Let's go with that. <laughs> they are set apart by their inability to roar, as well as the fact that their leg structure and their foot structure is totally different. They don't have the retractable claws of the lions and leopards. It's just a totally different body shape that is built for speed rather than for strength. And there's also, they're also one of the easiest animals to habituate 
if done properly. Let's try again and head back over to James and his lion. So we just were driving up the road and there we found another one. So here's the fourth Birmingham male and I don't think that he is, well I don't know, he's not the same one that you guys saw today on going to Buffalo or Gizzy. I don't think so, Chandra. Um, anyway, he was away from the others and he is limping a bit, but I did see some vehicle tracks around where we saw him, so I think that he was probably here at some stage this morning. Definitely a Birmingham because he's close to the other three. He's only about, he's basically the same distance that we were from the Birmingham boys when we first saw them. He's swimming around the place. And he looks to me to be slightly larger than the others. Is he older? Um, looking at his nose, I'd say no. He's probably about a five-year-old. But his mane is darker and it is fuller as well. And that is an indication of testosterone. So this chap, I would say, he's probably, while there is no dominance hierarchy within a coalition, I think this guy has got quite a lot of, uh, well, he's, he's certainly got a lot more dominance potential than the other two, than the other three, because of that blackness in his mane, which, like I say, is an indicator of testosterone. That tweeting you can hear above us is a whole group of red-billed buffalo weavers. <laughs> That's so cool. Anyway, we just thought we'd come and quickly show you this chap. I think they were all where he was this morning. And the other three, Chandra, if you just want to quickly show us where the other three are. They're under that tree over there. You can just see a tree with a white little bit there where the bark's been torn off by elephants. That's where the other three are lying. So he's now about 150 meters. Chandra, how many meters? That's minus 152 meters from where their companion is. OK, we're going to leave them now for good unless we find another one on the road and go back to those magnificent cheetah. Well, James heads off away from the lions. We're going to stick around a little bit longer for with these cheetah. This is definitely an animal where the novelty has not quite worn off for all of us just yet. For me, it is such a pleasure to spend a little bit more time with them. And we spoke about the difference between male, uh, between cheetah and the other big cats, and I mentioned how they're built for speed rather than for strength. And Zoe, no, they never keep their kills up in a tree. They actually don't have the strength or the climbing skills. And because although cheetah can climb trees, and I have seen them climb trees, in order to scent mark a little bit higher off the ground. It's not something that they are particularly specialized in. They really do struggle or would really struggle to pull a carcass up, even a small carcass up into a tree. It's not what they are designed for. And the other difference, or the other interesting thing about cheetah and their approach to food is they're actually quite fussy eaters. Um, they very, very seldom scavenge unless it is a cheetah that is absolutely desperate. Whereas a lion, a leopard, they will quite happily feed on a carcass that is not fresh. We've seen Tingana and Karula scavenging off a very old buffalo, and we've seen lions do the same. Cheetah are less inclined in that respect, and generally their meals are consumed in one sitting and one sitting alone, and then they move off away from them. One of the reasons behind that is because at the bottom of the predator hierarchy they cannot defend their kills against any other animal that might want to steal it. I have seen it, I have once before seen a cheetah stand off with two cheetahs against one hyena and even then it was a, it was a, a standoff that was 
very brief, and it was more show than anything else from the male cheetah concerned. They do a, a charge that is totally different from that of a lion or a leopard. They have a very straight-legged, bouncy charge as they growl at you. It's a completely foreign experience. I've only ever been charged by a cheetah once, and that was completely accidental, and it was a very, very wild. It was, it was not in a reserve. It was a very wild cheetah on a farm with a sub-adult cub. And she charged me in defense of her kill. It was a fascinating experience. Because for the most part, cheetah actually habituate, of all of the big cats, cheetah actually habituate the most easily to human presence, particularly human presence on foot. And I've been fortunate enough to spend hours at a time with two sets of cheetah brothers where I used to work, Babalo and Nasedi and Songo and Sanana. They were just the names that we'd given them in the area, the research that we used to do. And we used to be able to find them. It was a much more, it was a closed system, so it was a much more confined area. So they were easier to find and easier to spend time with. But I used to be able to sit about 15 meters away, it was about 45 feet, even closer at times if I was alone, and just sit and watch them behaving naturally. It was such a pleasure. They are very special, very interesting cats. Cheetah cover enormous distances in terms of their movements. The reason that we see these males fairly regularly is that they walk and patrol fairly regular routes in order to mark off their territory, whereas with the females, females often don't even have a set territory. They might have an enormous home range. They might even be nomadic. And cheetah are a rare exception in the animal kingdom in that you have to have a higher male to female ratio for the success of the population. And James Blair, you were wondering if cheetah mate for life or if they are more like leopards or lions. The answer is they are more like leopards or lions. Um, and if we had to go with it, we would probably say more like lions in the sense that the males will patrol. Mm, no, actually, let's, let's keep it as leopards and lions. The difference with, with male coalitions in cheetah versus male coalitions in lions is that for both, having more means an extra advantage. It makes you stronger than the neighboring male cheetah, the strength in numbers. It means more people, or more, sorry, not more people, but more individuals to hunt. So for males, it works to their advantage, but there's very, very interesting studies into the genetics of lion male coalition versus the genetics of cheetah males. And generally, almost always, a cheetah coalition will be made up of brothers, usually from the same litter, and at a stretch and in very rare circumstances, they will be made up of cousins. But that's quite, as, a, as I said, that's the exception rather than the rule. The interesting thing about cheetahs is that a male, in a male coalition, one male will be dominant and will almost always have sole access to the mating rights. Whereas with, for example, the Birmingham Boy Coalition, all five of those males have had their opportunity to pass on their genetics. Potentially be the fathers of the new cubs over the next few months. With cheetah, there's usually only one individual that gets to reproduce. It does, that's not always the case, but it is usually the case. And the reason behind that, the reason they've got such different approaches, it's, that is why in cheetah coalitions, they are so almost strict in a way about which individuals they accept into the coalition. Because if you are the sort of the submissive brother and you are now assisting with the passing on of genetics that are not your own, you want to make sure that they are as close to your genetics as possible. So it's worth for them, it's worth the investment of protecting a territory and sticking together in a coalition, provided their brother, who will share 50% of their DNA, is the one that passes on the genetics. Whereas with lions, as I said when we chatted about junior, very often male coalitions are made up of lions. It's not the case in the Birmingham boys, but very often coalitions are made up of lions that are not related to each other. 
It doesn't really work that way with cheetah at all. So these, these guys are probably brothers. And most likely, if the rule applies here, and of course, you can't ever have a strict rule in the bush, but most likely these two boys are brothers in terms, and probably from the same litter. And it's going to be so much fun to get to know them a little bit. And this is perfect cheetah territory. Open space so that in the chase they can actually stretch out to their full limit and reach their full speed. And at the same time, plenty of little bushes and shrubs which will make sneaking up on the prey slightly easier. And that's one of the reasons why we are so excited to be traversing cheetah plains. And Dreen, you were wondering what the chances are of us seeing cheetah cubs in this area. I'm still getting to know the different individual cheetahs. So far, as I said, I've only seen these two boys once or twice and that very skittish male that made his way onto Juma a couple of weeks ago. If a female does decide to come and have her cubs in this area, then she will not move too far away from it. So we could well see cheetah cubs in the future. I cannot, I would say the chances are high over the next few years. I wouldn't necessarily say that the chances are high over the next few days, weeks or months. I haven't heard about any female with cubs in this particular area. But then again, as I said, we are but a stone's throw away from the wide, vast expanse of Kruger and a part of Kruger where there are very, there's very little public activity, very few roads. And there's always a chance that a female could wander through with little ones. And male cheetah tend to be a little bit more tolerant of offspring that are not necessarily their own. Oh, rolling over. They're not as likely to set out to kill a female's cubs that they haven't mated with. It's interesting. It's one of those interesting aspects of cheetah behavior. It's still a possibility, of course, to bring that female back into estrus, but it's not always necessarily the case. Somebody's got an itchy back of head. Susan's picked up on a very interesting aspect of these cheetahs' behavior, and that is Susan's remarks upon the fact that they seem to look up more regularly than when we sit with the other big cats asleep, and was wondering if that is part of diurnal behavior or if it is a product of the fact that they are at the bottom of the large predator hierarchy. Oh, roly-poly. With that enormous stomach, I'm not surprised that happened as quickly as it did. Susan, I, I would say that yes, it is more likely a product of the fact that they are a weaker cat rather than it being diurnal behavior. So with wild dog packs, whenever we've sat with wild dog packs in the heat of the day that are asleep, they sleep properly. Cheetah are, need to be a little bit more on alert. And particularly with those full bellies, they probably feel a bit more vulnerable than usual. Because although you can never underestimate their agility, they probably feel a little bit less agile than they might usually. They might also just be hot and uncomfortable with those round bellies. But yes, I have noticed with cheetah, they tend to be a bit more restless. You can also factor in the diurnal point. They are daytime animals, although to be honest they're more crepuscular than they are diurnal, especially in summer and autumn when it's a bit hot for them to be constantly moving throughout the day. The early mornings and the late evenings are the best time to view cheetah activity. I also think, to be honest, I think the flies are driving them mad. You can see how those tails are constantly sweeping backwards and forwards. I also think and this is an observation that isn't backed up by any research or fact that I know of. I also think that cheetah have more conscious control 
over their tails than, for example, leopards do. And I don't know if it's the product of the way in which they use them in running. Perhaps they need a more conscious level of control. Not 100% sure. Oh, a couple of yawns. Maybe they are going to get up. Really, really nice question as we watch these cheetah from James's Cap on Twitter. Uh, James's Cap was wondering, thinking a little bit about, for example, the fastest bird recorded or the fastest diving speed of a bird recorded, the peregrine falcon, and the cheetah running, and was wondering how animals like that that are capable of moving at such high speeds cope with the um, the speed of or the wind pressure around their eyes. Now birds and falcons included have a clear solid nictitating membrane that sits across their eyes that they can bring across the eyes in order to shelter them. It's clear so they can see through it even if it might distort a little bit but they can see through it and that's the way falcons cope with it. It's basically like a third eyelid. Oh. No, don't go that way. Come this way. This way. Not that way. Come on, boy. Oh, he's just going for a, a slightly cooler spot. On hot days like today, with those round bellies, the ground where a cat has been lying after a while starts to heat up and is no longer a nice, cool place to lie. And so they get up and they just relocate to a cooler spot, just like turning over your pillow at night to rest your head on the cool side. Also moves them away slightly from the flies. So James's cap with cheetah, I'm not 100% sure. I mean, they, they do have a thicker membrane than we do around the eye. They've also got residual third membranes in, in the corners of their eyes, but those don't come out really to cover the eye while they're running because that would make them far less effective as hunters. So I guess they just have to narrow their eyes and deal with the wind chill and the wind impact in that way. But it's a very interesting question and we'll discuss a little bit more about the cheetah's eyesight when we return. In the meantime, let's head over to James and some of their favorite food. Now, I am prone to a bit of hyperbole now and then, everybody, but this is a giant herd of kudu. There are nine of them here, at least. All females, I think maybe one or two males just about to pop through their horns, but I think probably an equal split of adult females and calves born probably late last year. And they've done very well to escape the attentions of the lions and survive this long. Isn't it pretty? the light filtering through the green leaves and onto their unusual colors, I think. They're kind of a, a gray-brown, and it's a brilliant color to be out here. The white stripes just to break up the... ...is a browser, not eating grass, but eating leaves of trees. As I say that, don't eat grass, kudu. Make me look like a fool. <laughs> I mean, they will every so often eat grass, just to hedge my bets there. They all look very peaceful, I must say. Chilled to the max, as they say, in the more modern parlance than I'm normally able to speak in. And just very special that you've been able, or we have all been able to spend such a lot of time with those cheetah. Once again, for my idiocy, I'm unable to adapt again to these front and back microphones. So when my voice fades, I'm sorry about that. Jean-Dre has just beaten me over the back of the head. 
Next time you see him, he will have a hole in his forehead from a Sisyphus tree. <laughs> So all of these youngsters have, although they're only probably what, say, shall we say, five or six years old, uh, five or six months old, they have already weaned. And they're all fully into eating leaves at this stage. I'm just going to reverse slightly. I think they are truly spectacular antelope, the kudu. Are you happy here, jean -Dave? No, we've probably got the best view that we're going to get. And we've come into the area around Treehouse Dam, in the, well, I mean, it's probably not vain, but in the hope that maybe we'll pick up tracks of Karula and her little babies. I have yet to see the little, well, I have seen the little ones once by mistake. And so that's what we're going to do. All right, let's quickly go back to the cheetah. They're starting to move. One of our cheetah brothers has already moved south and across down into Mala Mala. The second is yawning and rolling around on his back. Up there he goes and he's going to follow suit. So this might be, in fact, probably will be. Oh, that's so beautiful in this light. The last view that we have of these majestic cats for the afternoon, although I don't think I've ever seen a cheetah as fat as this. They are positively enormous. I'm going to shuffle forward a little bit just to get one last view. Yeah, he's going to disappear very quickly. Since we have seen them now two days in a row, Jeffrey, watching in Texas, was just wondering, these cheetah needs na need names, who gets to name them? And it's something I'm actually going to ask the other guides in this area, Jeffrey, just because they will have seen these cheetah on a more regular basis than we have. And it might, we might find that they already have names, although I must admit I've never heard them referred to by name. There they go. Last view of our lovely Cheetah Brothers. So at some point, yes, I think that a name would be a very good thing. We're going to double check with the other guides to make sure that they haven't got names already. And then at that point, I'm sure that we can open it up to the floor if they don't have names and we can decide exactly what it is we're going to call them. But let's wait. Let's just wait. Hold off a little bit, see if we see them regularly or if this was just a once off really good two days. I think we're going to see them regularly. We know that they walk this path all the way from here, from south of us in Mala Mala, all the way through Torchwood, through Buffles Hook, and into and onto the signboards around Manuleti, in the middle of Manuleti, where we used to drive past in order to get to our camp when we used to live there. So we'll have to, I'll discuss with the other guides, and we'll just see what kind of naming procedure we're going to follow. And as I said, these cheetah cover tremendous distances as part of their territorial patrol. And Alexandria, you were wondering, would the brothers leave cheetah plains if there's no females to mate with? or would they wait for a female to come to them? ...kilometers, which is just around 13, 14 odd miles, but more. So their territory extends very far up to the north and probably covers a size far larger than, for example, Karula's territory maybe even as large as the territory of the Birmingham boys themselves. So they won't stay in Cheetah Plains. They will patrol. They will patrol all the way around, probably into the Kruger National Park and Koror, Torchwood, Biffles Hook, and then come back onto Cheetah Plains once again. And males tend to walk more regular set routes than the females do. So. They won't leave Cheetah Plains because they haven't had access to females. They will just leave because that is what they do. I'm 
now cruising along. Just want to make sure that I'm not going to go dashing off into the wrong area. Oh, okay. I know where I am. All right, that's perfect. Watching the cheetah wander off, Charlotte was wondering, Charlotte who is watching in Port Elizabeth, if, any, if one particular brother will be the leader of the two. Now I mentioned that one is more dominant in terms of mating opportunities, but Charlotte in terms of movement or hunting or anything in that sense, no, they will, they'll move around each other, they will both mark the territory equally, they will take it in turns to walk in front because generally they will cover, they will walk in a single file for the most part, especially if they're trying to cover distance, just because it's slightly quieter that way, the same way that the lions do when they're out hunting. So no, there's no set leader. You might find one has a slightly more dominant personality than the others, just as we see with, for example, the Birmingham boys. One has a more dominant personality than the other. And it, it's not about size, it is very much about attitude. Brian, you've been here before. This, this isn't the boundary. Boundaries a bit further. I think we'd know. I think we'd know if we were about to trespass into Kruger. <laughs> I'm gonna keep finding my way. I'm trying to head to Buffalo Pan. And while I search for Buffalo Pan, James has actually found some buffalo. I hope Jamie is not disappointed by Buffalo Pan because when I went there, uh, well, I got lost and drove into a solar-powered pump of some sort, uh, but there was no water in Buffalo Pan. But some very beautiful trees. You can ask her to show you the weeping wood bean there, which is very attractive. Lots of nice trees. So we have found some buffalo. Obviously, that's what you're looking at now. The Cape Buffalo or African Buffalo, not under any circumstances the water buffalo despite the fact that they are in the water. A water buffalo, commonly confused with the Asian version of a water buffalo, from which you get very nice mozzarella cheese. Try and make mozzarella cheese out of this thing. It will be the very last udder you ever try to milk, I assure you. Well, especially if you try these bulls. They don't have udders, of course, do they, Jean-Ray? <laughs> that story kind of got away from me, everyone, and I'm mine started moving faster than my mouth. Anyway, back to what we're seeing here. This, this buffalo is chewing the cud, and that means he's re-chewing his breakfast, probably. I always like to see buffalo this time of the day. I feel that they are, well, I guess, I hesitate to say this, they remind me of my father, I suppose. <laughs> They're very relaxed, they're kind of done with the day's work, and they're having their tea, basically, and contemplating life before they go off on a crepuscular walk of this general surround, followed by a bit of supper. Now, what is interesting here, Jean, yeah, those two ox peckers, you see the one on the right is begging from the one on the left. But interestingly, he looks like he's a juvenile yellow-billed oxpecker because he's got a yellow beak. He clearly isn't. I'm sure he's just in, in a transitional phase. I'm sure he's a red-billed oxpecker, despite the fact that he has got yellow on his beak. And I think he's a red-billed who's just begging from his mum there, hoping that she'll still give him some food, even though he's well old enough to be feeding himself. I'm just going to quickly check in the book. Because the, and for those of you who don't know, uh, the yellow-billed oxpecker is much rarer than the red-billed version. And the juvenile tends to look the same with a colorless beak, but they don't have a picture of a kind of intermediate one. So let me check on my very clever app on my telephone, which I have lost sometime. Let's drive. Andre. Sorry about this, everyone. It's gone. It's gone. Oh, there it is. Okay, I've got it. I've got it. 
suspicious now. Now, for those of you also, I was just reminded while I was talking about this yellow-billed ox picker, or possible yellow-billed ox picker, that we saw today two yellow-throated petronias. Now, I know many of you like to keep bird lists, and I would love to know if any of you had the yellow-throated petronia, it used to be called a yellow-throated sparrow. I'd be fascinated to know if any of you have seen a yellow-throated petronia before. Andre, have you ever seen a yellow-throated Petronia? Uh -uh. I didn't think so. I'll show you a picture of one, everyone. That, that was definitely a yellow-billed ox picker. Look, Andre, I'll show you. Well, I think it was most likely. I mean, one doesn't want to say definitely too, too loudly in these particular areas. So we look here. Those are yellow-billed ox pickers, all of them. Hold it as still as I can and adults all the way along the top of whatever creature that is that they're sitting upon. But there is a, I think a juvenile yellow bill with a yellow bill just like the one we've seen, which I think is really quite interesting. Yeah. I just got to tell you that the, um, the amount of willpower it took for me not to start tearing at the flesh on my left, right calf right now is astounding. There is a biting fly. It is going to die. Sorry about that violence, but it was very, very irritatingly sore and itchy at the same time. Okay, let's leave these buffalo. They're about to go off, as is my father, I've no doubt, on his evening walk. And we'll go off towards Twin Dam, like the stage. And then we'll do a little turn down the sun, around the southern boundary see if we can't find some tracks of Karula coming this way. Draw black, John Gray. So those ox peckers, of course, their large part of their diet is ticks and other ectoparasites that live on the buffalo's skin. And Ginny in Texas interested to know whether those arachnids, which are the ticks, are able to survive in the water or whether they drop off when the buffalo gets into the water. I think almost without question they stay on the buffalo. I think some of them will probably drown while he's under the water. I suspect that is also one of the main reasons why a buffalo spends so much time lying with his undercarriage in the water because, of course, those are the soft, exposed bits that the ticks get onto. So, yeah. And then also, in the water, what is interesting is that a, uh, a terrapin, a serrated hinged terrapin, often plays the role of oxpecker in the water. And they will go and take the ticks off the animals that live in the water, which I think is quite interesting. Thank you, Janine. Jean-Andre, that fly did great damage to me. Nathaniel, you are in school right now, in Jackie's class in Illinois. And there are a few things to your question that I think are very interesting, and I'd like to address them all. The first is that you, well, your question is, are African buffaloes dangerous as American bison, and will they hurt people with their horns like American bison? Now, there are a few things about that. First of all, Nathaniel, I don't believe that any animal in the world is dangerous unless it feels afraid unless it feels scared. So I bet that you've had an experience or two with a domestic animal like a cat or dog, which is relaxed, but if it becomes scared, it will become aggressive. So that's the same thing with wild animals. So those animals, are, they are potentially dangerous. They are not dangerous by nature. Now, interestingly, Nathaniel, the American bison, before, or in prehistory, is much tamer than one of these buff African buffalo. And you will read stories of the old American West where, uh, you know, the pilgrims, for want of a better term, <laughs> would walk up to them. I mean, you could walk in amongst a herd and they'd do nothing because they didn't, they didn't react to people as hunters. Slowly, I'm sure that relationship has changed, especially when guns arrived on the continental United States 
and so the bison would start to be killed a lot more. And I mean, the thousands and hundreds of thousands of them were killed by hunters over the years. I think that's probably made them quite a lot more angry than they were before. The African buffalo, however, has evolved with people. And because of that, is more likely to be afraid of us and therefore more likely to be dangerous than an American bison. So Nathaniel, that is the kind of answer I would give you. I don't think that a, I don't know much about American bison, save to say that I don't think that they are what we call inherently dangerous. I don't think that they would charge you for no reason. If they were very scared, then they might. And the same thing goes for the African buffalo, which is known by hunters to be a very dangerous animal. But that's, of course, it would be, because if you hunt an animal, it is obviously going to become dangerous because you are threatening its life. Thank you, Nathaniel. Very good question. And I hope you keep watching. And I hope most fervently that you will be able to come out here one day to Africa, even if it's to East Africa, to see the wonders of the wilderness out here. Ah. Now, I have had a hiatus of questions from my friend Gracie, who lives in Ohio. And Gracie, I'm very pleased to hear from you again. Uh, I don't know why you haven't been asking me questions. I felt very sad over the last few days that you haven't been asking me questions. So please don't stop asking me questions, Gracie. And you want to know if I can find you a flower today? For you, Gracie, anything. I will definitely find you a flower. I will, I will find you 10 different kinds of flowers, Gracie. I may not be able to identify them all, but I will find you 10. How's that? No, I can't see any, but I will find some. As the drive. Oh, you got one? That's that one that smells like diesel there. Anyway, it still looks pretty pretty. There you are, Gracie. There's your first flower. That's a white flower, uh, whitish green, and the leaves smell like diesel and I can't find the flower in any of the books so I don't know if anybody can find it for me I've asked Judy H who's the resident botanical expert on Twitter I haven't managed to find any responses but I haven't been particularly uh, um, fastidious in my investigations of Twitter over the last little while so there's your first flower Gracie and while we look at the second one Alexandria you want to know what the difference between a home range and a territory is, and I assume because maybe Jamie was talking about home ranges and territories with regard to those cheetah. A home range is not actively defended. So something like an elephant has a home range in which they will normally live, but they don't mark the territory and they don't <coughs> defend it from other elephants. So that would be a home range. Then a, a lion, for example, has a territory. It's got an area that it will mark actively and that it will not allow any other lions into. And so that was the difference between the territory and the home range. Gracie, your second flower. Ooh, this is a nice one. Let me see. Get it, get it for you, Gracie. You are looking at the acacia flower, are you, Jumbo? So I'm going to pick this one for you, Gracie, because there are lots of them. And what I'm going to do, smell it. Now, Gracie, I want you to take a deep breath in through your nose. Right about now. Go. And what you'll smell is an orange. It will smell like you've just put your nose into an orange. And that's what it tastes, smells like. Here you are, Jean-André. Smell that. It's the first year I've ever noticed that these acacia flowers smell like oranges. jean Ray just put it into his nose. I don't want it back again. Thank you very much. So, Gracie, that's two. Two flowers. Let me plug myself back in. McLennan Smith will start shouting at me. There we go. Turning into another beautiful afternoon. No, 
Now, about a year, two years ago, I would have said no. Patricia, uh, you want to know about grasses and do we ever reseed them or ever reseed trees? In this area, we wouldn't know. Um, unless there was a kind of major erosion event or, uh, you know, we might. Uh, in if Say they closed up or took out um, one of the dams, Bifles of Dam or something like that, then they may well reseed some of the areas. So, yes, they could. And you can buy, the reason I say this is because I did some investigation into it, you can buy um, natural sort of rangeland grasses in packets. Ah, oh, thank you, Jean-André. Utterly unidentifiable. Um, <laughs> well, don't know what that is. Gracie, there's your third one. Don't know what it is. I'll try and see if it smells like anything. No idea. No. Smells like nothing, but I'll hold it here and you can see the little white blooms. Now, normally, white flowers do actually smell quite sweet. This one does not. And then trees. No, we wouldn't really reseed trees. Um, no. I mean, largely there are substantial numbers of trees out here. And so whereas, yes, they would be reseeded in urban areas in South Africa, like Johannesburg, for example, which is the largest urban forest in the world, it actually shows up. Some of the parts of Johannesburg show up as a rainforest on satellite maps. Um, but no, not in this area, unless you were rehabilitating a piece of land, so if you destroyed a dam and you were going to rehabilitate the area, you wouldn't be planting any grass or trees. highlight of Twitter names. Uh, Senior Gold, you are currently my highlight for this day. Senior Gold, you want to know about controlled burning and do we do controlled burning? I know there's a slightly easier one further forward here. I'll get back to you now. We've just found the fifth flower. This one is called Justitia flava. It doesn't smell like anything. And while we look at the pretty subtle yellow blooms of Justitia flava, it has no English name, no common name. Um, senior gold, what we do is we do burn sometimes in some areas, and it really much depends on the individual landowner's perspective on whether controlled burning should happen or not. The only thing to say is that uh, controlled burns have, or burns have happened in this area for many centuries, of course, but normally on a much larger scale than private landowners are prepared to do. Because, of course, if you burn your whole property uh, in the springtime, then, well, you're not going to have game until you get, until you get uh, rain. And that's not great for tourism. They're controlled by teams of people. We don't need things like helicopters out here. So, unless, of course, it's a real runaway fire. And in fact, they did call in helicopters um, a little while back at Londolozi. I remember there was a big fire there. And they called in those big helicopters that put a, uh, out fires in the forests. I don't know what that one is, John. Um, so that's basically how we do it. All right, let's pop across ooh, just before we do that, John. There's a flower spot with notes to that. You got that? Sorry, I'm trying. I'm doing my best. I'm shouting. Right, here we go. We'll do it out. We'll go and head across the plane. Now. Here you are, Gracie, number six. I'm not going to pick it because it's on its own. No smell. Uh, 
I think. The leaves don't smell of anything either, but I, it looks like a Meirua species. It's quite possible it's a Meirua or bush cherry species, but I might be wrong. Let's go across to Jamie, get an update for her on cheetah plains, and I will see you a little later. I didn't manage to find Buffalo Dam. I went slightly off the beaten track and not really 100% where I intended on being. Nevertheless, that is half of the adventure and half of the fun of driving around a new reserve is being, as I said at the start of the drive, not lost, just not entirely sure exactly which road I'm on. So we did do a very brief detour. What's this? It's got a scorpion, I think. This hornbill's got a scorpion in its bill. Go back a little bit. I just saw the curve of a tail. There you go, you can actually see the claws. Oh no, it's not a scorpion. What is that? It looks enormous, whatever it is. I thought I saw scorpion claws and scorpion tail. But now I'm not so sure. It looks like a giant caterpillar of some kind. Proving to be quite the challenge for this yellow-billed hornbill. Oh. Or not. All gone. You can see it's struggling to swallow there. And that goes back to what we were talking about with the ostrich. The fact that that hornbill just swallowed that entire something. I'm not entirely sure what that entire something was, but swallowed it whole without any kind of chewing or breaking it up into small pieces just goes to show how important the muscles, the strong muscles of the stomach really are in terms of basically making up for the lack of teeth and for their mastication ability. That was really interesting. That was an enormous mouthful for that horn pole. I'm back on the beaten track. At least I think I'm back on the beaten track. It's certainly a track I know called Owl's Nest Road. So we'll be keeping an eye out for any owl's nests. Most often the roads out here are named in all parts of the different reserves. Named for a particular feature that is found along the road. You will probably find that at some point when this road was named, there was a nest for some species of owl. It could have been anything from a pearl spotted to could be a giant or a rose eagle owl. That's a little bit less likely just because they prefer the more riverine and large tree vegetation, jackalberries, leadwoods, something a bit bigger for them. But I'm also trying to see if there isn't an artificial owl box. That could also be a possibility. It's so much fun discovering an area. Brian and myself are actually going to start making our way back towards Juma just because James's spotlight wasn't working terribly well this afternoon when he set out on drive. So we might have to be covering the last few moments of the show. And I'm not sure how well, I'm still not 100% au fait with exactly where the bad signal patches are on Cheetah Plains. There might be certain areas that are worse than others. And we'll head back to where we know we have signal at some point relatively soon. And as I take a slightly different route to the one that I'm more familiar with, Tim, who's watching all the way in Arkansas, was wondering if there are any plans to put a camera up around Cheetah Plains. And Tim, no, not that I'm aware of. I mean, we are a camera on Cheetah Plains at the moment, but I'm, I know what you mean. Tim is referring to the various waterhole cameras that have been set up by Wild Earth in a whole load of different locations. There's one at Juma, there's one on Arethusa, there's Pete's Pond, there's Mashatu, Komoritan, there's all kinds of different cameras set up around the country. Now, as far as I know, no, there aren't any plans to set up a camera on Cheetah Plains. There is a camera up on, at Nkoro, 
which very often or very regularly sees either the Birmingham boys around the water hole or else the cheetah. I know that they were seen on that camera maybe about a week ago at very, very close range. So Tim, whilst I'm not aware of any plans for that aspect of our cheetah planes, Travis, at least you have the Incoral camera to watch, which is not far at all. In fact, I could see the tower for Incoral. While I travel back along what I think is Pipeline Road, I'll send you back over to James, who is continuing his flower collection for Gracie. We found another flower, Gracie. It is a blue plumbago, and we found a white version of the plumbago yesterday. And this one I will pick for you. And I know you were watching yesterday, so maybe you saw the white plumbago, and it's exactly the same shape as this one, but it's white, obviously, and this one is blue. And the thing that I showed you was that the seed, once it forms, is very sticky. Very sticky, and if an animal walks past it, it will stick on the animal's fur, and that's how the seed is transferred. Is that, a, is that any good? Is that better? I just get shakes of the head from jean -Dre. It's like I've disappointed him all the time. Now he's nodding his head. So that's the seed, Gracie, and that's how the plant transfers itself all over the reserve. How many is that? Seven. Seven flowers. Ah, jean -Dre found this thing, which I think is particularly unattractive, but that's not unusual for jean -Dre, of course is this is a sedge, Gracie, and we're going to call this number eight. But what's interesting is though it looks sort of fluffy and cotton wool-like, it's actually got some fairly vicious little thorns in it. And that's what we call a sedge, so though it looks a little bit like a grass, it isn't. There we go. He is quite attractive, I suppose. It's number eight, Gracie. Two more. I did say I'd find you ten. Two more it shall be. I'm not sure if we're going back to Jamie. I'll just quickly find out from Kirsten. No, he's playing with me. Oh, I've got a bit of plumbago in my hat. Just look up here. You can see this tree's about to fruit, Chondry. I'm not going to change my hat. I know that's what you thought I was going to do. Um, there's some fruits in here, and it's, an Im it's relevant to the last few drives we've done because, of course, these are the fruits from which the side-striped jackal... No, I've got that the wrong way around. It is the side-striped jackal, which we've seen two of on Cheetah Plains in the last little while, that give this tree its name because they eat the fruits of the Gendre jackal berry. And I've just spotted a ripe one. I'm not giving to jean -Dre. That's a bit unkind. We'll get him one. Maybe with a worm in it. <laughs> now, these are actually some of the nicest fruits that we get here. That's a, those are jackalberry fruits. And this one's got a blemish on it. It's bruised. So that's jean -Dre's one. There you are. Skin is horrible, but the flesh inside, it's quite dry, but it's sweet. This one's overripe. Oh, Excuse me. It's like a banana. It's like banana. I think may, mine may have been handled by a baboon. Anyway, baboons love them as well. Jackalberries? Very delicious, except for the one that I picked for myself. Serves me right. That's called karma. There. Um, Raisa, you asked a question that I this now slipped to my mind. Oh, you want to see a devil's thorn? Now remember, we get two different kinds of devil's thorns. One's called sort of. Um, 
one is uh, that sort of uh, trumpet-shaped purple flower, and we'd find them on quarantine clearings quite a lot of. The other is a small yellow flower, which makes very nasty little thorns. We need to find the last two flowers quite quickly, of course, because the sun has gone now, Gracie, and so all the flowers are going to close. What have you seen? Ah, the Waltheria. There we go. Gracie, number nine. That's called Waltheria. And lots and lots of the butterflies that we've been seeing, that jean Andre loves so very dearly, have been feeding on that Waltheria flower. They've bloomed all over the place. Also has no smell at all. Right, one more. Before the sun deserts us completely, I think you've got a little bit mixed up, but I might be wrong. There we go. There's our final flower. Barbji, you say that butterflies in the United States eat mostly milkweeds. Here we have a string of stars, Gracie, and uh, we saved the best for last. The string of stars, a beautiful little array of star-like white flowers. So, Gracie, if we... Uh, not Gracie, um, Barb G, if you look at that... Sorry, but I am going to ask you to try and get your camera onto that butterfly there. Just quickly, it's a monarch. And, Barb G, you say that the butterflies in the U.S. eat milkweed. Yes. Not the butterflies, but the caterpillars of that species there, the monarch, eat milkweed. Absolutely. We do get milkweeds here, and it makes them toxic. The, act the adults, though, don't seem to feed on the same thing. The adults feed on flowers. You can see there the adult is looking for flowers to feed on. That's brilliant, John. Well done. That's, that's awesome, I think. I know you don't like it, but I think it's incredible. And so the, the larvae or caterpillars will eat the poisonous milkweed, which will in turn make that adult poisonous to birds which want to eat it. But not all butterflies do that. You know, just about every plant out here will have a, a, a caterpillar that will eat it. So not only the milkweeds. Nice question there, Bob G. Thank you. And, of course, that butterfly finding it increasingly difficult to fly as the sun has gone down and the atmosphere is starting to cool. Wonderful. Thank you, Andre. All right, let's go from the butterfly uh, to an angel. Let's go back to Jamie. very nice of James how very very sweet of him sounds as though he's been doing some lovely work as well though collecting 10 different species of flowers uh, while James has been flower picking Brian and I have been dealing with a medical emergency or almost a medical emergency <laughs> poor Brian had the most enormous what looked like actually did look like either a, a small fly or a small spider that had managed to make its way onto poor Brian's eyeball and did not want to, no matter what I did, didn't want to get out. Brian managed to get it out eventually, but he's looking a little bit red-eyed in that eye shape. It is one of those occupational hazards of driving around in the bush in an open vehicle. Every now and again, an insect comes along to make itself very closely acquainted with you very often aiming the, towards the eyeball area. I'm glad you're okay, Brian. I hope you're okay. <laughs> as the, got a spare eye. It's all right. That's true, actually. <laughs> Brian says he has a spare eye. He does. Um, but as a cameraman, I imagine that he would prefer to keep both eyes. And as a, our crucial spotter on the back, we definitely want to keep both eyes healthy and functioning. So far, my explorations of cheetah plains have been exceptionally enlightening. There is such a stunning, it's just always just behind the trees, but there is a really stunning view of the Drakensberg Mountains. I think we might be higher than we are at Juma. You and I view of this beautiful sunset. 
lots and lots of trees in my way, however. We might get to a clearing at this junction. That's another joy of exploring a different area, is finding all of the nice high points to go and look at the sunset, have a look at the view, learning the different game paths of the animals. This looks like it might be a little bit more promising. Here we go. We've just missed the end of the sunset. The beautiful Drakensberg Mountains. We've come a little bit lower than we were earlier, so there's a bit of a crest in the way. Nevertheless, a stunning view. There's a cuckoo calling somewhere here that we haven't seen in a very long, well, I haven't seen in a very long time. A levelance cuckoo. It's also Sam's favorite bird, the black-headed oriole, whistling away. Lovely. Nice to just sit and enjoy a peaceful moment after an afternoon filled with all kinds of extraordinary sightings from the ostrich to the cheetah. Cheetah Plains definitely living up to its reputation. But that setting sun is just a quick reminder that I need to start heading back towards Juma since James will fi has found himself spotlightless for the evening ahead. And I think I shall be returning to Cheetah Plains many times in the future. The one thing I am going to say is that there is far less general game than there is on Juma and Arethusa. And I think that is a product of the fact that they haven't had as much rain as we have further to the west of them. I've seen very few impala, very few warthogs. The wildebeest that I saw were far away on Mala Mala. That's not to say that Cheetah Plains always doesn't have general game. It just seems to be the case at the moment. It's much quieter than it is on Juma. That, that being said, of course, I haven't explored all of it. I've only explored a little bit of a little section of it this afternoon. And I find myself quite reluctant to leave this new and unexplored and uncharted territory, at least for me. Not quite grass. I 
quite as much grass growth in the that was also Juma and Arethusa were also struggling in terms of plant growth. Two and a half weeks ago. But Cheetah Plains hasn't quite recovered. We're going to go through a shaky signal patch back across to Jen. Said that you had, we could see the embers of it before it disappeared over the mountains there. I think our plan from here, everybody, we haven't found any tracks of Kurula or her little babies here on the southern boundary, and it's now getting quite dark, so we probably won't spend any more time around here. Let's head towards where the Nkahuma Pride were on Sandy Patch earlier today. We're quite away from there, but we'll go and have a look there and see. We're going to keep an eye on the road until we turn off it, which is going to be over here. Yes. <laughs> Gracie, it's my pleasure. You said thank you for finding you an African bouquet of flowers favorite was the orange smelling one because if you had orange juice so you could smell exactly what it smelled like. Good. There are the great mountains of the dragon's back behind which the sun has just sunk. I'll stop over here and be with Andre. I always quite like to frame it with this uh, dead tree here. I know that uh, you might not. Now, some of you have uh, claimed that I only found nine flowers there. I cannot possibly be expected to remember exactly what they all were, but I will just give you another one quickly, just in case. So, while Jean Andre shows you the sunset, This one, Gracie and Jandre, smells like aniseed. And it is the wild aniseed. And the flowers are not very pretty, of course, but they do smell amazing. So, next time you are in a sweet store, go and find the licorice place and smell one of those licorice sticks. And that's what it smells like. There you are, Jandre. You may have a smell of that. Ah, there we go. Andre doesn't like licorice. I'm not a big fan myself. My father discovered that he does like licorice when we went to Greece two years ago, and they gave him an ouzo, which is a drink that they make from aniseed. I find it to be quite the most disgusting thing I've ever put in my mouth. Right, there we go. Let's see if we can find the lions. smelling all of these flowers as we go along and some of them smell nice but lots of them don't smell like anything at all and Bradley you want to know why that is why do flowers not smell Bradley the question is easily answered or more easily answered by answering the opposite why do some flowers smell why is it that some flowers have a scent and remember that the reason some flowers smell is that they are trying to attract the animals that pollinate them so the vectors that either pollinate them or carry off the seeds. And so if a plant doesn't smell, you've got to ask what it is that is pollinating that plant. So in the case of something like those yellow flowers, which seldom smell, you'll find that it will be a, an animal or an insect that finds things not by smell, but by sight. So a bright yellow flower will probably attract, say, butterflies, which I think, as far as I know, will probably scent something in the air or see 
the bright colors. Then you get some plants, Bradley, that have a runway. So often those trumpet-shaped plants will have sort of purple. They don't smell like anything, and they've got purple lines. And they're like a runway for insects to see. Insects see in ultraviolet, or they can see the wavelength ultraviolet, which is too bright for us to see. The wavelengths are too small. And they are able to see ultraviolet, and so some plants produce ultraviolet, which is a visual cue as opposed to an olfactory cue. So they see rather than they smell. So basically, the simple answer, Bradley, is that some plants attract their vectors or their pollinators through smell, and some plants attract them through, through sight. There we go. Long way around, that's answer. And of course, many herbs around the world are used for many different kinds of medicinal purposes. And Vera, you want to know if any of the flowers here are used medicinally. They are. I don't know of any specifically other than some very obvious ones, like something called Lipia Giovannica, or the Bushman's Tea, which is used for colds and flu and that sort of thing. I mean, lots of the trees and oh, lots of the trees and the roots of the trees you can read about and they'll tell you that they use for various medicinal things. But I think the flowers, absolutely, especially some of the herby ones that smell quite strong, are used medicinally extensively, especially out in the rural areas here. I know a little bit about the trees that are used medicinally, but very little about the flowers that are used medicinally. As we drive through this little bit sort of clearing with the bit of smooth road, the moon genre is, uh, is waning, is waxing. <laughs> Stop and have a look. The dirty look I got from Jandre when I asked him to face the camera on this jerky vehicle. There we go. It's just slightly larger than it was yesterday evening when he showed it to you. and I'm going to need Rain's question again, please. Ah, now we're talking about flowers and we're talking about all sorts of plants in the absence of any mammals around here. And Ray, you want to know if we get cactuses here? We don't. But what we do get, Ray, is something called the euphorbia. Not many euphorbias in this particular area of the Sabi Sands, but we do get some on the rivers, especially the Mandileti River, which is dry most of the time. That's sort of off to the west of us, and then it bends around to the south, and you get something called a rubber euphorbia, which doesn't look like a cactus, but its relatives, especially in the Eastern Cape and in various other parts of this country and into Namibia, they look like cactuses, and that's what they are. But the actual cactuses that you get in the United States, we do not find in this part of the world. Well, not naturally. There is one called the Queen of the Night that does grow here sometimes, and that has to be chopped out because it is a virulent invasive, so it will spread very enthusiastically if it is not uh, sort of dealt with. That's called the Queen of the Night cactus. And then in the other desert areas like Namibia, you will find things like aloes. And you find aloes here too, but in uh, rocky hillsides and that sort of thing. And they look a little bit cactus-like in that they are succulent. And then all over the Karoo, which is the semi-desert area in the middle of South Africa, you'll find lots and lots of different kinds of succulent plants that are able to deal with dry weather, like the cactuses of the continental US. Very nice question there, Ray. You can tell we're quite close by to camp because there's a very, uh, we're not going to go back to camp, there we are quite close by. There's a very subtle smell of wood smoke floating in over the air. And this is the best smell of the coming winter, that smell of a warm fire as you head for camp.
and I, well, I do, talk often about the dawn chorus. And Kelly, you asked what the first bird to, that we can hear is. Are we able to tell you what the first bird is? What is the last bird before we go to bed at night? I'm going to exclude all the nocturnal birds, Kelly, which, of course, will start to call round about now and into the dawn. But the first bird that you hear in the dawn is normally the grey-headed sparrow. I was taught that by a friend of mine once, who's a very good naturalist, and he woke me up once at about four o'clock and he said, look, I told you, there's the sparrow calling. And it's a very un indistinguishable kind of chirrup that a sparrow makes, grey-headed sparrow, but that's what you'll hear first, and then you'll hear the Franklin starting to call. But always just before the Franklins will come the grey-headed sparrow. Then last at night, I'm, I think, pretty much, I'm pretty sure, is the white-browed scrub robin and, oh, and the drongo. They, the, they the last two. So what will happen is that as it gets dark, you'll hear the white-browed scrub robin going... <laughs> and one or two of them will make the normal call. And they'll go silent. And then you will find drongos, interestingly, sitting on the ground, which they never do during the day, often just sort of sitting on the ground, playing with each other or having a dust bath. And they will make their last kind of, um, it's quite a harsh, harsh call. And then that's it for the day. And there's a slight lull, which I call the changing of the guard, for the night uh, uh, birds start to call. The owls, night jars, and the thick knees, for example. the road, a GNU, um, I'm not going to, well, sort of very cleverly migrated away from our ability to see him. <laughs> Wonderful shot there, isn't it, Jean-Dre? Yes. I predicted his behavior perfectly. There he is. get to the lines eventually. They're not too far from here. While we're doing that, let's drive a bit quicker. Let's head across to Jamie and get an update from her. This is definitely one of the most stunning times to be out in the bush. And even with this autumn chill that sets in, it's still hugely pleasant. You get that relief from the real extreme heat of the afternoon. And there's the excitement of all of the nocturnal animals that are going to start coming out earlier and earlier. James has been talking about the dusk bird chorus and all that it entails. It is lovely to just sit and to listen to them chirping away. I've come along to the eastern boundary I want to try and follow up. This morning we had leopard tracks heading across in this direction, but there was such a confusion this morning in terms of elephants walking all over the show, walking all over the tracks, lions walking all over the place, backwards and forwards, that we never managed to figure out exactly where Tingana moved from yesterday afternoon on the Sunset Safari. He seemed to go on to Buffalo's Hook Cutline, so our northern boundary, and just keep going east. But then I had very fresh tracks doubling back like he'd done a loop almost. Unless, of course, there were two males on Juma last night. There's always the possibility, given Mvula's current unpredictable movements, he could well have been hanging out around the drainage lines of Galago Pan. This afternoon was hugely pleasant in that we... Oh, I can switch radio channels here, sorry. We are hugely fortunate this afternoon and yesterday in, in being able to spend time with a cheetah and we spoke about their lack of ability to retract their claws. And it's not completely true. They, they can't retract them all the way into a claw sheath but they do have some level of muscular control over them, so they can move them backwards and forwards, just not quite to the same extent as leopards and lions. And they do show up quite clearly. A 
Okay, sorry, just listening to an update now. Apparently the Nkuhumas are at Sydney's Dam and we're gonna race across in that direction. Hopefully we get there in time just because James doesn't have a spotlight or signal around Sydney. So we'll head across in that direction. Let me just hop onto the game drive channel quickly. James for Jamie. Uh, James, I've just got your update now about the Zmafazi and Gala. Do you know what the lineup is like? Go ahead, Mike. Copy that. Thanks, Mike. Um, I'm still on cheetah cut line, so it'll take me a while, but I would like to respond. Copy that, thank you. All right, let's put foot a little bit. You can't really Ferrari Safari in the dark in the same way that you can in the light, just because you can't see as far ahead. So we need to move at a slightly more reserved pace. And while I head off towards the Nkuhumas, let's head back over to the back of James's vehicle with some very tall animals. Is that not the most spectacular sight of the dying embers of the 11th of April, the giraffe silhouetted in the foreground. Gonna be quiet for 30 seconds or so. Just have a listen to the last of the day's sounds. Interestingly there, although I told you that the drongos are the last calling birds, I still think they are. Um, they're just not as loud as some of the Franklins, which I can hear shouting off to the left-hand side of your screen. In fact, basically behind your screen. And there's also one nocturnal bird, the Scops owl, that has started calling. Now this giraffe is familiar to us. It is the giraffe that we watched trying to mate, or seemingly trying to mate the other day, with a very frustrated looking old bull. And this is just the way it is with giraffe. They have these kind of uh, prolonged courtships. And the most fascinating thing about her was she then tried to mount him once the frustration became so extreme she tried to mount him, which was extremely unusual. And they're still together. He's around here somewhere. We did see him. Now, Jamie is going to the lions because they have moved. They've gone north to Sydney's dam. Oops. Pick your feet up. And we are unable to go there because we don't have a spotlight. Unfortunately, Jigger's spotlight is uh, not functional at the moment. And uh, we're not sure why that is the case, but we will rem attempt to remedy it. Also, of course, the signal on Rusty is brilliant at the moment, so she's going to head off to Sydney's dam. And we'll continue around here and see what other little wonders of the early evening we can find. much bigger than the female. And of course, easily recognizable by the fact that he has 
the tail of a polo pony. <laughs> it looks like it has a mind of its own without the long fly swishing hair on the back of it. Looks like a snake. And he's just staring off wistfully, of course, off to the west, hoping that his love will not reject him any longer, even though he seems to be completely incompetent at the job to which he was born. I'm being very unkind, of course. It's just how giraffe courtship goes. We had lots of comments from our viewers saying that they had seen giraffe attempting the same thing for up to three hours at a time and failing to consummate their marriage. Mm, what a lovely evening. Little breeze there, you can see you gently ruffling those leaves. And the giraffe chewing on his cud, his dinner. And there in the background, as I said, hear the white brown scrub robin. You won't be able to hear it from here because it's behind us. It's just such a wonderful silent time of the day. This. We were asked recently what our favorite time of the day is. And I said the time just before the sun comes up and the time just after it goes down. Of course, in this part of the world, we don't have a lengthy twilight like you do in, at higher latitudes. So if you're in New Zealand or in Europe or the northern states of America or Canada, you'll have a very long twilight. Here, when the sun goes down, you've got 20 minutes of light, basically, before it becomes dark. And it's those 20 minutes to half an hour that I just find the most magical times of day. <laughs> and James Richard, yes, you're absolutely correct. There is something very special about a giraffe sighting at dusk. And indeed, jean -Dre, I think our very first drive together ended with the giraffe at dusk, didn't it? Very romantic. It was very romantic. You can hear a couple of rain locusts maybe starting up. And if ever you are in need of some kind of calm or peace or wilderness healing, if you like. That may sound twee, but half an hour at this time of day and silent contemplation will leave you refreshed like years of psychological therapy. We'll just try and move slowly around this giraffe. John Ray reckons we'll get a better shot of him with more of the sky behind him. Let's go across to da Jamie. She's got also a picture of the western horizon. We'll try and get into a beautiful position for this giraffe. We'll see you shortly. Oh, look at that. <laughs> a spectacular sunset. A view from right on the top of a crest on Buffalo's Hook Cutline, the northern boundary of Juma. 
And our race to the lions is no longer a race to the lions. The lions have managed to escape us. They've moved further north towards Manileti. And we no longer need to rush across in that direction. We can just stop and take in the view for a few seconds. the skies with its long dangling feet. The moon is also looking really, really beautiful. Hmm, look at that. This moment to sit and just listen for any lion calls. Back over to James and his view of the giraffe in this stunning light. Look at that gnarled old face on the bull. You can even see his eyelashes there in silhouette. He's limping. He's lived a good full life out here. I reckon he's probably pushing 18 years. Potentially could live to 20. But if he limps like that in front of the Ngahuma pride, his days of walking the plains in the sunset are going to disappear. What's that genre? Isn't he lovely? And thank you all for your screenshots of this stunning scene. And just in the background, you may be able to hear a little bit of noise of running. There are some wildebeest. Genre, shall I try and go back? Mm. Try and move back. Wildebeest are running towards quarantine clearings. The night is upon us. Chandra, I think the sunset goes rather nicely with my new brown hat, don't you? Who may lie? Yes. pretty not to just keep doing again and again everyone especially as we don't have a spotlight oh let me tell you a little bit about what i can smell like i say a very gentle breeze coming out of the well unusually the northeast yeah. and you can hear oh you can hear you can smell the subtle smell of those that, um, that aniseed. I can smell some in the air. We're obviously quite close to quarantine clearings where there's lots of that. Otherwise, it's just sort of very fresh. But it's the silence that is the best part of this. It's very seldom that the bush is actually silent. And I don't know, you wouldn't have heard it there, but we could actually hear the click of that giraffe's teeth as they closed. He's 
so cool. <laughs> This is just perfect. So you can tell his age even at this kind of angle with those gnarled bumps that he has on the front of his forehead, a calcification of his skull that happens to all bull giraffes. That's a postcard right there, Jandre. Don't you think? Jandre sets himself very high standards. He says, yeah, it's OK. I think it's brilliant. Better than a butterfly. Better than a butterfly. <laughs> All right, let's ease our way onto quarantine clearings and see if there isn't anything going on there. The wildebeest have made their way onto the clearings. Them. No doubt there are lots of impala there and a whole lot of zebra as well. While we do that, let's go across to Jami and see what she's doing. Uh, this morning, after our brief encounter with the angry elephants, we did eventually manage to track down a Birmingham boy and from the tracks, there was a female with him as well. One of the Inkahuma lionesses were with it, was with him as well. I think they got separated by the elephants charging. Not Obviously, I didn't see it happen, so I'm not 100% certain, but they, both of their tracks went into that block and only he came out. So what I'm doing now is really carefully checking along this northern boundary where he disappeared off to see if there's any chance that those two are still in the area. When we saw him, he was constantly sniffing around. He was looking for something. Now, I think if he'd been sniffing the territorial marks of other males, he would have scent marked on top of them, which he didn't do this time around. So he could well have been looking for her. And we're just gonna go through a bit of a dip. We might lose the signal here, but it'll be quickly. should be fine. So yes, he was on the search for something and I suspect that it may have been her. I just want to double check carefully as we come to the end of the sunset safari that she's not still around. That being said, of course, and on a night like tonight and every night, we're also looking for all kinds of interesting small and nocturnal animals. I've tracked an artfark before all the way from Biffles Hook Dam straight west along this road. So they do use, the nocturnal animals do use this as a regular highway. And all animals do do that. Roads are useful routes from place A to place B without having to push through any vegetation, without having to make too much noise. They've learned to utilize the road systems that we have created. And you'll see it even when walking through a part of the bush without roads. The animals make essentially game trails, hiking paths themselves, just by a regular route. It's the route that the animals can follow that's the easiest for them to walk along. Elephants in particular, of course, make very lovely paths that look like they've been man-made. And hippo as well. Hippo make these unique two-track roads, like a tiny little car has been driving along there on their regular nightly pathways. And on these journeys at night, as we go into winter, we should also be seeing more and more hippo out of the water as well. see if for the last few moments of our sunset safari 
we can't get a really lovely bush baby sighting to finish off the afternoon or just any one of the nocturnal creatures out here. We've had such an unusual afternoon from ostriches to cheetah. We've been thoroughly spoilt and I hope that pattern continues. Let's try and get something exciting for the last few moments. Lions, of course, or leopards are just as exciting and something that we're keeping an eye out for. My personal favorite sighting in terms of nocturnal or secretive animals would have, I guess while I've been here, would have had to have been that serval that Viam and myself spotted on Zoe's road. Just because we, we, de we tend to, as guides, get more excited in those kinds of sightings than we might do even for a leopard or for a lion because we hardly ever see them. A serval, maybe a porcupine. I've got a porcupine call sitting in my car so that from this morning, so it might still be good luck. There's a little Dacre. Now, the reason I didn't stop for that Dacre, I mentioned that I saw a little Dacre, but that I didn't stop, is because as a diurnal animal, it, having a light constantly shone on it, will act to take away its ability to see at night. To, essentially, it takes away the light vision. Nocturnal animals have a more reflective layer, that tapetum lucidum is more pronounced at the back of the eye to enhance ambient light. So it's not a problem spotlighting them, but with unfiltered white light, we cannot spotlight the daytime animals. And William in South Africa, welcome William to the sunset safari. You were wondering if there are any prey species that have nocturnal vision or nighttime vision. And the answer is they all do to an extent. So they all see better than we do at night. Their number of rod cells in their eyes are, are more numerous. So they can make out, in, even in low light, they can see relatively well. Not as well as the nocturnal animals, but well enough to survive. And of course, they would not, they would not have succeeded as a species without that ability to see in the dark because you cannot run away from a leopard or a lion or anything else that might be after you if you can't see where you're going. Now it's more that it is their reflective layer is not as well developed so it doesn't bounce back the light as well as the nocturnal species do. I'm trying to think if there's any specific prey species as we would term it that are nocturnal. And I suppose the definition in this sense of prey is an animal that's not a predator, I guess would be a way of describing it. So an aardvark, for example, could be considered to be a prey species. It's a rare animal, it's a nocturnal animal, but we know that animals feed on them. We've seen, we've heard, well, you guys have seen, I've heard stories of Tingana catching and hoisting an aardvark before. Porcupines could be considered prey species. They are the largest of the rodent family. So just like most other rodents, they are on other animals' menu. So they could be considered prey species. They're purely nocturnal, so they have excellent night vision. A pangolin, again, a nocturnal animal that is an insectivore feeding on ants and termites. It also has, is purely nocturnal. What else would there be? Honey badgers definitely don't count. They're very pred predatory. They are capable of raiding all kinds of things and catching snakes, and mice, and other such things. So we won't include them on the prey species list. So yes, William, there are certain animals that have as good a nocturnal vision as our no nocturnal predators, so our leopards, our lions, and our spotted hyenas. We as human beings probably have the worst of the nocturnal eyesight. To, to toss up between us and the other primates, the, the daytime primates, such as the monkeys and the baboons, just because they have evolved that system of climbing up into trees and making themselves safe up there, although still their eyesight is better than us because being up in a tree doesn't necessarily guarantee you are safe. 
and there's still a chance that you could be caught by something like a leopard or a Varose eagle owl. In general, we have lost our nocturnal vision and that is one of the reasons why it is absolutely foolish to go walking in the bush at night because lions and leopards have evolved. Oh. Leopards and lions have evolved alongside human beings and they have evolved being more dominant than us in terms of being the dominant predators at night. During the day, yes, we are absolutely in, an intimidation to them, or intimidating to them, rather. They are fearful of us. They have thousands of years of evolution of human beings being dangerous during the day. But at night, they are, lose their fear almost completely and they become far more dangerous to people. You won't find any of us that will walk very far at night at all. We're just not suited for it. And that's why you get that feeling of you want to go home at the end of the day. Most people feel that. And it's because your instinct from back in the time before we had safe havens and safe houses, when we still had to be on the lookout for animals that wanted to hunt us, that instinct remains with us still. And even though we don't necessarily feel it as fear, we do still get that feeling that actually I want to be home and enclosed somewhere. Now Kim, who is one of our new viewers. Kim, you were wondering, please, please, can we find you an owl? Kim, we're gonna do our absolute best. We're running out of time for this sunset safari, but I am trying, and I know that James will be trying as well. Kim, if we don't find you one tonight, and maybe we won't find you one tomorrow night, but I promise you, if you keep watching, we will at some point find you an owl, be it big or small. Oh, we've come to the end of a wonderful sunset safari. Thank you so much, Brian, for your company and for battling through with the bug in the eye, the spider in the eye. We've had a joyful time exploring Cheetah Plains and Cheetah Plains living up to its name providing us with two male cheetah and lots and lots of ostrich. I will catch up with you tomorrow morning for the sunrise safari. In the meantime, I'm going to send you back over to the wonderful James Hendry so that he can say goodbye as well. Now we've just driven through an area, everybody, that I was trying to describe some smells to you earlier and I don't think I was doing a very good job. But we just drove through a field of sort of herbaceous plants or flowers and there were two very distinct smells that came to me. The first was ice cream. It smelt like ice cream as we drove through and then, a bit like now, it smells like guava roll. I don't know if you remember what guava roll is. It's that kind of dried guava. And it's a lovely smell, I think. I'm just turning the lights off because we're going past some impalas and they don't like the light. They become stunned, like many of the deer that you have in North America. You see, already stunned. Get out of the way, let me silly. There we are. So we've got the side lights, but not much else, I'm afraid. Oh, the smell of wood smoke is drawing me home. to get home uh, with the cameraman in the wood books of course because you will have to work with him again tomorrow and the next day okay that's going to be it from us everybody thank you Jean-André for your efforts today especially on the butterflies good job a big thanks to all of you for your questions and comments we've had some great questions and little Gracie I'm glad you enjoyed your bouquet sleep tight wherever you are well I know where you are you're in Ohio Big thanks to the final control, Kirsten and Jerry and Rebecca. We'll see you tomorrow at 05.30 as the sun breaks. Bye-bye.